Hey, I'm Mohamed, uh, CEO and founder of Colena, and I'd like to drink my coffee black with Two Splenda. What is up, MLOps community? We are back for another podcast. I am your host, as usual, Dimitri Os, and today we're talking to Mohamed, my man, my close friend, who I have been collaborating with a lot recently. We are doing this AI quality conference in San Francisco, and he is the other co-organizer, the other brain behind it. And I've got to say, I had to have him on here just because his vision for AI quality and what it means, what the industry is lacking right now when it comes to putting AI in production is so cool to see. He breaks it down. I went deep on how you can look at testing, how you can look at quality, how you can look at frameworks. And one thing that I really appreciated from this conversation was how he broke down the gold standard that we're trying to create here with the conference. And after the conference has finished, we will continue to have working groups creating AI quality gold standards. And he breaks down what that means, what the working groups are going to look like. And we're launching it right now. If anybody is interested in joining one of these working groups, hit us up because although there's still about two months until the conference happens, we're going to get cracking and the wheels are in motion. So last but not least, I mean, he he dropped so many gems on me that I I really want to say everything, but I don't want to spoil anything. So let me see if I can be vague enough to not kill it for you when you hear him. But his idea of making sure there are standards that for each industry, you have standards and then inside of each industry you have for each application you have these gold standards and what these gold standards look like is what i really enjoyed because you can easily throw around the word standards and i actually grilled him on this when it comes to how are we going to make sure if we create standards it doesn't just become another meme like the oh yeah we had 12 standards yesterday and now we have 13 standards today that comic that i'm sure everyone who has thought about creating standards has faced and I thought his answer to that was insightful and brilliant and so this idea around industry and applications inside of the industry and each of those having their own quality standards was so cool to see I really enjoy the way that he thinks of things and how he's moving the ball forward in this domain hope to see you in San Francisco June 25th if you can't make it hit us up We would love to chat with you all about these AI quality metric standards, testing, you name it, we got it. And as always, if you like this, share it with a friend because you know the world needs more AI quality and especially those big businesses that are losing money every time they put out one of those shitty chatbots. All right, see ya. Dude, no, we got to start with the question that I know everyone wants to hear in your eyes, what does AI quality mean? What is AI quality? So that is the, that's the question of the hour, right? Everybody's asking this question. We talk to hundreds of customers uh, all the time. And then we, the question is, and even when we talk about more details about let's build quality standards, people are start asking, what does that mean? Um, let me actually tell you a, a, a good story here, and then we jump into it. So um, if you uh, give context for everybody as well, we at Colena, we're building AI uh, testing and quality validation tools. So we've been working with um, enterprises, enterprise customers, and uh, leading startups, uh, building on top of Gen AI, or even robotics, if we're talking about the kind of what has what became all the AI now. And then we always think about, okay, what is this? Uh, what can we do more, right? And we are a testing solution, and we see our customers testing, rigorously testing their models and finding exactly where the uh, failure points look like. But we still feel, we have felt that something is missing, something in in their testing process or their validation or their seek for high quality uh, product, something is missing there. So we were having um, one of our internal uh, product uh, design sessions. And then um, our CTO and founder, um, Andrew Shee, uh, shared like a really good insight. Like he asked a question or uh, threw a statement on the table and it just kind of changed our perspective. Uh, he mentioned, he said, uh, we are 
providing testing to our customers were not providing quality. And that had us start thinking about the question that you just asked, what is quality? Right. So uh-huh. we started thinking about, okay, how do we, what is that? What is quality and how we can define that and actually help our customers achieve? Because that's the end goal. Testing is a step in the quality process towards that quality goal. Right. So we started zooming out and thinking about what is uh, AI quality in our case. And then the quality here is dependent on the application and the domain that this application is being used uh, in or being uh, the problem that's being solved. Um, to give you an example here is just uh, outside the AI side and we come back to it. If we're thinking about uh, like this pen here, it's a $1 pen, right? And is this $1 pen better quality or would this pass the quality bar more than a $100 pen? Now, this is a quality dif- question, not has nothing to do with, uh, with uh, AI, but it's a manufacturing quality question. And they had this question asked, the like, same question, what is quality 100 years ago when they are building these standards? So the, the answer here is this $1 pen can pass the, the quality bar and a $100 pen not pass its own quality bar. And this is to answer the question, there are different quality standards based on the application that you are using it for. So the $1 pen here is not expected to um, perform under severe uh, weather conditions, for example, right? It's not expected to live for years. It's expected just to be disposable, use it for a couple of months and then throw it away. Now, Having that context defined, let's think about Gen AI, for example. If you're building a chatbot for uh, that will be used in Twitch for a gaming, you know, industry. Now, the quality standards for that is diff- completely different than the quality standards from a chatbot used in a fintech company or in a bank, where you are prohibited by law to give a financial advice. And even if you're allowed to give a financial advice, you have to be very precise. You can't say uh, three-ish. Uh, uh, the price value is, is going to be three years. It's going to, or it's going to go high. You have to be very precise in timing and actually what is that uh, um, a change that's expected. So with that, then gold standards or quality standards for the AI product. Now, in our definition, it means it's built for it's built for specs for the specifications that is meant for, and deployed safely. Right. So that's the whole thing, like hallucinations and all the uh, issues and risks that come with it. This is, these are all called risks like NIST, the National uh, Institute of Standards and Technology in the US. They define that as risk management framework. So if I am a data scientist and I'm thinking about what is AI quality for my product, it is, there is two main sections. One is what are the specifications? What is it intended to do? And what are the risks that are associated in your industry? Then you're able to benchmark or test your models or your products based on that. So we ask a lot of, uh, the, the, then I will give you the, the short answer, right? Like uh, what is AI quality? We ask a lot of uh, leaders in the data science and AI space, and then they tell us like, in the name and terms, which actually makes a lot of sense, I exp- the, the quality means that my product performs as intended, right? Safely, that no, no risks associated with it that we don't know about. And that is the thought that happened to us to so start thinking, okay, for us to deliver quality, to our customers and to the industry, we need to define these gold standards for each domain. Brilliant. There's so much to unpack there, man. The, especially, I really like this idea of the pen and you have two separate pens. One maybe has diamonds on it, the other doesn't. And you have two separate quality standards that when each one of these comes off of the assembly line, they're going to be inspected and they're going to pass the quality check if they or if they can pass the quality check, that doesn't mean that the one dollar pen is going to be able to pass the quality check of the diamond laced pen, right? Absolutely, yes. So, and then if it's diamond laced, you have your your quality requirements will include the diamond quality requirements too, because it's the quality requirements for your product. Yeah, exactly. So, so there are many different layers of that quality to make sure that it's not only the actual ML, but then you have the software and there's that tried and true practice of yeah quality assurance and then you've got the actual product yeah if it's sitting let's say if you're deploying on edge right then latency is part of your quality requirement I mean, if it's not like if but it, in terms of uh, latency is it's is a fact much more if you're deploying on edge on some hardware so you're thinking about the specs of the hardware should be that high or that good so it gives you a response within half a second 
or 500 milliseconds versus, you know, a couple seconds if you're doing on cloud, for example. So that could be part of your quality requirements when in, in, in the on edge deployment or on time sensitive applications, depends on how we start thinking about breaking down these standards. Well, you mentioned gold standards and knowing that each one of these specific use cases feels like it has a new set of gold standards. How do you go about creating that? Because if, if I'm thinking about it, I'm like, okay, cool. The financial advisor chatbot, it's never going to say that it's giving financial advice, but that's one lane of gold standards. I feel like you have to really curate and create gold standards for that use case. Is it like you need gold standards for each specific use case? Or can you generalize the gold standards? Like break down what exactly these gold standards look like. Yeah, so it, it will not be too too detailed to the use case level. You can generalize that more. That provides the same details, but it doesn't have to include the overwhelming work of defining each specific use case. Um, so it would be for the domain, like let's say fintech, right, uh, or banking. And then, then within the domain, you will have you you have to fork out for what kind of application it's been used in. Um, it could be in 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 banking, but you still it's a customer support kind of banking application, or in banking as well in financial services. So if you are seeking, let's say, fast forward many months from now, a few months from now, and we have like a, a rigorous gold standard developed by the industry, you probably you need to get into okay Gen AI standards and then double click in, into that and then get inside the financial sector or the banking industry and then get into that and then if you're building a, a customer support bot you will see it there if you you, you, you get to see what the, what are the functional requirements that you should be thinking about and the acceptable limit so we talk about um latency just talk about it now then what is the acceptable limit here for a um, a bot that is in customer support it's maybe it's fine to give you an answer in five or six or seven seconds Right, and then you can add a spinner or something that for for UX. Um, so, and then that's one thing. And then you go back to the financial sector again, up, and then go down into uh, financial advice or financial advisor. Now you have a different set of requirements here that you, you need to think about. And they're always would be thinking about this for for months, and then they are almost always fall under one of two categories. One, the functional requirements, which is what you're intending your users to use, which is the use cases that you talked about. And the other ones are the risks associated with the technology that you're using. The technology that you're using here in this case is Gen AI. Now, what are the risks? We all say hallucinations. What, what are these hallucinations, right? Now, if you hallucination, that could be here, uh, like we said, like how, how if you're asking a question and it's not a part of your right, uh, system, you don't have the answers for it, it can confidently give you a wrong answer. That is yeah. the known type of hallucination. But another type of hallucination is jailbreaking. So it gets outside the guardrails that was built uh, around, that it was built around, uh, like uh, actual builders of the application. Like don't give financial advice. Or you can give financial advice, preempting it with some kind of a caveat. Based on my uh, uh, understanding of the industry and, and analysis, here is what I can tell you as an automated bot. Like there are some regulations here. This is when we want to work with regulatory bodies as well to tell us how we can bridge this gap. These standards have to be defined for the industry and for the type of the application. And then now you get to say, okay, the acceptable um, score, because now you work with everything you said, you need to figure out the metric for it and then how to test it and what's the acceptable score because you get some scores at the end and you don't know what is that score for, right? You don't know if that's good or not. So based on the acceptable, here are the acceptable limits from, you know, 70 to 90% kind of accuracy in these things, based again on the application that is being uh, developed. So it feels to me like, and I, I appreciate the idea of industry and application because it feels to me like you have a certain baseline that you're probably going to see across the majority of the applications and industries. So if you have a chatbot in a financial use case, it's probably going to need a lot of the same stuff that a chatbot in the insurance use case needs. Or if it's a customer support in finance, it's probably very useful to have customer support for like a telephone company, right? Absolutely. Then you, depending on each one of these specific verticals, 
and each one of these industries, you're bolting on specificity, I would imagine. So what is wild to me is how you need to fan out and think about all the different use cases and then all the specific risks that are inherent with these use cases and in these industries. Yes, so it is a huge undertaking here. And it doesn't it doesn't take uh, one person or one company or one institute to go ahead and build this whole thing. Um, and that's why, you know, that we are we are uh, working together, Colena and the MLOS community in, in hosting the uh, AI Quality Conference. And the AI Quality Conference, we're, tr- we're thinking about it here as a, we try to find another word other than conference, but this is the kickoff of this AI Quality movement. We are putting together a nine months program to build these quality standards. And to be able, from our understanding, and, and we believe that the, the best way to build a applicable and safe gold standard for quality, you need three main players to, to be in the room. The builders, the AI builders, we understand that, and regulatory bodies, obviously there, and the ML ops or the tooling and the infrastructure layers. I've seen like the quality you know, uh, triangle, that these are the three diagonals. Trifecta. These, the trifecta. They, <laughs> there you I go. Love it. Because these are the, the ML ops toolings or the infrastructure uh, companies. These are the people who are going to make it feasible, automatable, because the builders cannot be um, stalled down or, uh, or slowed down by like, a lot of governance work or, or, tr- or providing a trace to their data and their models, everything that's required. But for that to be implementable and actually uh, the, the AI builders adopt this technology, it needs to be, or these regulations, it needs to be um, automated in a, in a very um, uh, uh, supporting fashion to the data scientists. Like they don't need to think about what's happening in the back end. So we're bringing these three players together in, a, uh, uh, in what we call the AI Quality Conference, AI QCon. It's happening in San Francisco on June 25th. And in there we are, this is the kickoff, and then we bring in um, industry leaders, regulatory bodies, and uh, and obviously the level uh, infrastructure uh, companies and teams. And we are putting together a nine months program. This nine months program has three main uh, phases. Uh, the first phase is the, the the initial phase, like we are getting to understand, okay, discovery. What are the domains that we're thinking about? And we initially thought about three main domains: the um, the robotics. Robotics, we talked about, uh, now it's called uh, old AI, uh, uh, but the robotics uh, domain, think about uh, all the robots, including autonomous vehicles that are out there that being deployed in front of us, that we're starting seeing them. So that's that number number one domain that we're focusing on. And for Gen AI specifically, we're focusing on e-commerce and the financial sectors. Both of them are, this is where we see the, the uh, uh, highest adoption for Gen AI, and we're working on uh, defining goal standards for those. So that's phase number one, the discovery phase, and we will have three months for that. And then we, we the, the second phase is we want to define the risks and the application guidelines, the specification guidelines. So we, for each of these domains, to be able to allow the uh, provide some kind of portal where people will go ahead and select their domains, like we mentioned, and then zoom in to really quickly what is required from them, what are the risks expected. And this is, has to be something that is always updated with the updates and the technology is still in nascent stage now. So this is growing with every all the releases that we see every day. So the second stage is defining these risks and the specification guidelines and the, applic- uh, the applicable uh, uh, or the acceptable scores or guidelines for these. Now, last thing is the, the third, third stage, which is the last three months. We want to define the processes, the tools, the infrastructure, make something that is applicable. We want to see... Uh, industry leaders being able to just take this and give them to their teams and say, okay, start building against that. That will be a great stepping stone for regulatory bodies to start thinking of a practical way to enforce these regulations without stifling innovation uh, for the builders. Yeah, this is cool because it is something tangible that comes out of a fun party that we're having. Ah, right. we're, exactly exactly <laughs> we're gonna have a great time and nine months later there's going to be a baby that's born it's not the baby that you would think is being born oh, it i is just i just noticed baby. the analogy here yeah, i didn't think about it uh, it's actually yeah it's exactly nine months and a new baby is born that's a great analogy here uh, there we go and i really like that because 
the ability for us to be able to say, all right, we're going to understand deeply from the subject matter experts, from the builders, from the people that are creating the tooling for this to all try and work together and make this whole trajectory a whole hell of a lot easier, then that tangible thing that comes out in nine months is going to be so valuable for the community. Yes. And so that's the goal, right? We we have been, we, we see um, regulatory bodies are trying to uh, protect the people, us, right? Uh, we're, we are the builders, but we are the people to be protected. So they are rightfully doing the, what they are trying to do there. Um, but again, they are the, the AI leaders or industry, the builders, they, they have the right to think about, okay, there's like, so this tension, I see it as a healthy tension, right? That's, that's needed in these kind of conversations. And that's why I see that the infrastructure teams are within organizations or companies, they are, uh, they, I believe this is the, the magic, uh, you know, uh, magic stick here. Like uh, not necessarily in, like they're going to magically make it happen, but more importantly, okay, they, how can we use engineering to make sure that this is done safely without stifling innovation. And this way we are able to um, unlock this, this bottleneck where everybody's standing in, okay, we wanna regulate you and okay, don't regulate us. Uh, so in the, uh, in the AI quality conference, we are uh, bringing, we focus on bringing for when we're thinking about the leaders, the builders, we focus on bringing the actual people who are going influencing their teams. You can always get speakers, which they are great conferences to bring speakers. But in, in this specific conference, we brought the heads of AIs or the CTOs uh, in, in these companies that are, they are coming part of a mission, coming to kick off this mission with all of us. And everybody has 30 minutes, 45 minutes. That's not enough to, you know, share how they think about quality, but it's great to start. Here is the, as a kickoff, here's me as a company, how we're thinking about quality standards. Here's so on regulatory bodies are coming to us. So on the industry side, we're bringing uh, Mol Shinawi, for example, right? Mol Shinawi here is the CTO and president of Cruise. He's the man in charge of bringing this technology out to the, to the streets for us. So he will be sharing Cruise's end-to-end um, -end AI philosophy and how they are thinking about building new quality standards for autonomous vehicles. Uh, on the other, that's for the autonomous. On the other end, on the LM side, we have Richard Socher. He's a Stanford researcher, CEO of U.com, uh, and he's sharing with us uh, how they are building quality standards to build trust in LM-based applications. Now, speaking of the um, of regulatory bodies and the government, we have a government panel that's moderated by the Washington Post. They are hosting NIST. They are hosting the DUD. Uh, the uh, representatives uh, from the White House who wrote the uh, um, the executive order. Uh, we also are uh, bringing on a VC panel that is moderated by the information uh, reporter. So they are bringing in uh, VCs who are investing in tons of uh, uh, AI companies and applications to think about okay, what, where, how we can put our and uh, deploy our uh, resources and our uh, funds to to uh, promote this AI quality movement. So many industry leaders are coming, like we talked about Kodiak Robotics, Stork Robotics, that's an autonomous track um, on the LM track or Gen AI, there's OpenAI, Cohere, and Topic, and many more. So there's tons of conversations that we, the goal of these conversations, every leader is coming to say, here's how we think about AI quality, and here's we can, we're going to work together to define these gold standards. I just got to say, I am so excited to wear my I hallucinate more than chat GPT shirt uh <laughs> with a bunch of these government folks that are making regulations we're gonna see how that goes over and maybe some of them we're gonna we'll bring some and i'll give some to i want to see that yeah, yeah i'm excited for this one i'll be wearing it by too. the end of it <laughs> everybody's gonna be wearing that shirt and it'll be a good time it's a big step up for us man like let's be honest having a panel moderated by the washington post for me i never would have thought four years ago that would be happening with the MLOps community stuff. So it's brilliant to see that. I also kind of wanted to dig into this idea of, we talked four years ago and you were one of the first guys on the podcast back in the day. And you were talking about this. It feels like you've learned so much in the past four years because you've been out there, you've been talking with people, you've been recognizing like what people are saying 
as far as the quality standards, how they need to go about it. And the first thing that comes to my mind is that with this nine month project, and we're really going to try and create these gold standards, right? How do we not become the meme of, oh, there's 13 standards, but none of them work. We should make a standard that encompasses all of these. And then next thing you know, there's now 14 standards. Yeah, I mean, that's a very good question. We start thinking about this, given that everybody's thinking about gold standards differently. Uh, And it's a challenge that we will go through. And to say upfront, it's an evolving process. So there will be Let's define standards first. So if standards are a list of, like the, the way we envision what the standards would look like, it will be the list of functional specs, what's intended to do, and potential risks for this domain. Now, comes with it the, the methodology of testing. So for each one, it has a different methodology to test. If you're testing PII data leak, it's different than testing for correctest correctness or factualness of the results, right? So it has different methodology to test. So we talked about the uh, functional requirements and risks, how what's the methodology to test, what are the metrics that you're going to use, and what are the acceptable guidelines. Now having these four, that is the layout. That is the gold standard of the gold standard, if you will, right? Now is people start thinking about okay, I'm going to create different gold standards using this layout, this framework of thinking, right? So that is the framework. So that's one point. We get there, we're already winning as a community because we're talking the same language. So now now we're just agreeing or disagreeing on probably the acceptable ranges. This is where things are going to be left to the provider or maybe what are the metrics. This is evolving. But as long as we agree on, okay, you have to define the the risks and the methodology to test and that as well. So we have seen when we started, like you said, three, four years ago, when we started talking, um, uh, we had the conversation, you and I, we, we believe, like we, when we started, there was, Gen AI wasn't out there and we were looking, obviously we believe in AI testing and quality for AI in general. But when we looked at, you know, what, who is doing this too, we, we were the first ones to, to start thinking about it. And it felt like, okay, there could be something wrong. Right, like okay, maybe we're work- working on something that is not important or is not feasible. You know, you understand this when you're working on a on a new startup or thinking about something. But it, that was that that you know, concern uh, in our hearts when we started launching the company just went away in the first couple of weeks talking to customers and yeah. before Gen AI, the 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 amount of traction and uh, that that we got from customers like yes, we want testing. And the biggest thing we heard that's an old AI. Oh, Mohammed, I thought we were doing it right. Now I th- I'm rethinking. And that oh, that has been a challenge in early stages when we are like in our sales or go-to-market motion, that when you message uh, Demetrius, say, man, you're a great data scientist or ML engineer, we are a, a rigorous testing platform. Always the answer is, oh, we have something, right? Because yes, everybody has something. Nobody's pushing out a product. And we realized that, okay, the industry needs testing, needs rigorous testing, to be automated too, right? And but needs education on what is that testing look like and why testing will save your effort if you're thinking about effort on upstream processes like data labeling and and, and training. You can just label only the, the data that you want, saves 90% of your effort on labeling uh, instead of turning the, exp- uh, the model, staying in the experimentation stage and trial error, where okay, am I improving the model in these areas or not? Now we will exactly know where your models are failing, exact scenarios, and then you go ahead and fix them. So it turns the experimentational um, uh, nature of machine learning into an engineering discipline where you find a bug you inf- and, and test it and so on, and you improve it and test it. So that was for what neural network is and predictive AI. Now, came in Gen AI probably a year and a half ago or a year ago now, they have been now the evaluation that's called LM evaluations now, which is we like to think about as testing and quality more, has become the thing. Everybody's thinking about it, right? Which we're happy with this. Like, it's not about thinking about the competition. The, the, the business is big and the industry is is evolving very fast. But it's more important, like, okay, there's awareness here. The awareness part is gone. But we, we found, okay, it's still some awareness is needed. Look, at least the awareness in terms of the, the testing is needed, quality is needed. Now the second level of awareness is okay. What's the methodology? What are the what's the quality framework? 
uh, NIST likes to call it risk management framework. Europe called it the EU um, uh, trustworthiness, I guess, uh, act or, so, or something. They, they use a the term around trustworthiness, reliable or safe AI, something like this. So it is all, it all falls under quality. And things have been evolving very fast. So since you and I talked, it's been three years, but in the last 12 months, every month or so, like you said, we see a new uh, uh, development, a new evolution in the technology, in the standards, in the, in the regulations. And we're working on this. We're working on uh, with everybody, trying to just uh, make sure that everybody's working together and defining these for the be better for the entire industry. You said something before that I also wanted to dig in too, because you mentioned how testing is just one step along the way to quality. Yeah, I mean, there, there are two main sections for this. One is test coverage and one is what's acceptable, right? So let's break it down a little bit. Uh, one is test coverage, right? When you are testing, when you're like software, right? When you're testing in software, you have to assert a lot of functions, which is this is what the, the, like unit testing would look like in, in, in software. But you know the logic, right? You know what you're building. Testing in machine learning or AI is different. You're testing based on data sets. So when you are testing your your gen AI model, here, here's a good example, actually, outside LMs there. Let's say generative AI and images, Gemini, right? So uh -huh. Gemini is a great example for here. And then exactly like you mentioned, things are good until our, they are not good. You push I know something. Where you're going with yeah. yeah. <laughs> you give it yeah, to yeah. the world. So that is exactly, that's a great example of, okay, how do we, push out our first product with no embarrassing risks or even worse, no um, uh, impactful risks, right? So that's the first the first piece. And then obviously after that, how do you, that's the first product, how do you keep pushing out new releases and giving uh, your customers the better product? You, uh, you want to see regressions and you keep capturing uh, detail. Uh, yeah, because that's the thing too, right? Like you update and then all of a sudden it's way worse than the last version. I know that has happened plenty of times with GPT-3 and GPT-4. It's like, wait a minute, are things worse now? Yeah, it was good. So that that's that's exactly the the nature of testing today in AI jar, whether it's old or new AI, if we were to use these terms. So if you're thinking about um, Gemini now as a, as a case, right? And then you're you're writing, usually the testing is done, the old school testing is you're, you have some benchmark data sets uh, of, you know, prompts or, or, or even data. And then you're just, uh, let's say the benchmark is like a million data points. And then you're running your inferences on your trained model. And then you come out with, okay, my model is 90% metric, right? Uh, F1 score, recall, accuracy, uh, hallucination, however it is, right? So now this 90% doesn't tell you what's in the coverage in the test. You have a bunch of data. Usually you have some specs you keep adding to it but it's just a, a, bu a, a bucket of data that doesn't say exactly what scenarios are. And then the second point is the, the 90% metric. Like what does that mean? Right? Is it better than 85%? We don't know, right? So and so when you're setting up your benchmarks, it has to be, or the way we think about it here at Colena is the uh, test case-based evaluation, testing scenarios. So you create your data, you, you uh, stratify your data or, into, or prompts into specific scenarios. These are the to reflect your functional requirements. So if we're talking about, the, let's say, the Gemini case, they had a great um, noble goal, if you will, right? Like the goal was was right. Like, hey, we want to diversify. We don't want this to have any bias in race or bias in gender. That is great. So that's the requirement. Now, you need to, the way you construct the test case, you have to add the test examples. And we add that in our in toolings. That's why I'm saying email ops uh, infrastructure at Teams are very crucial in, in, in this process because they can just build in these uh, checks, data checks inside the, in the, inside the platform. So if that goes on to Colena, then the, the, the test case is for uh, to verify uh, diversity and no bias, right? So the, the data checks should look into negative examples too. So when you say, who are the uh, founders of, of the United States, uh, you that the, the quality check here should show that, okay, you need for factualness, you need to deliver the right ethnicity. Right, like this, that's the uh, a critical part because it's historical event. So in in that here, that hasn't been the test coverage hasn't tested that, and then I don't know obviously what's happening inside how they are evaluating uh, Gemini. But after after that, you then you define this is the test coverage. Okay, what am I testing? Yes, we said diversity. Then what is that diversity test case look like? Are we actually validating diversity in both ends? 
right? Are we diversity and factualness should come together? So that's the test coverage, breaking your data into test cases. These are test scenarios. And then- Wait, right there, just hold on a sec, because diversity and factualness come together. Those okay. are two different data points, right? Correct. What are other data points that would need to come together? Like there you gave two data points, but potentially what's another scenario where you have two different data points that you want to play nicely together that cover the test case? So it, the factualness usually comes with a lot of stuff uh, because you're trying to mitigate the risk, but you don't want to compromise uh, factualness or correctness in your answers. So it comes in, in different applications. Like um, I'm trying to think something off the top of my head. Yeah, if you're again Twitch example, right? Okay, who is the top scorer uh, in, in this game, right? It should, it, this is a rack system. Just go pulls that from, from there. Now, you don't need to opt. This is factualness. It has to be correct. You can't optimize for, okay, I'm going to say the top scorers, there are four, and I have to put, put two male, two female, for example, right? Yeah. So it, now in factualness, and this is how you design your, your your test, that factualness should proceed in most cases until I know something else. Uh, that it should proceed other risks like uh, like uh, in this one, but should proceed a risk that PI data leak. PI data leak proceeds factualness, right? So that now you start thinking about, okay, how they, they come together. And that tooling can make this uh, automated in the sense that the data scientists should not be thinking about what are the gold standards out there? What are the evaluation uh, criteria? I just need to share my problem, configure my functional requirements, and I see something populated based on my data. What, how are you going to test for the risks? And how are you going to verify that my test for the functional requirements are correct? And then after that, uh, we have the metrics and then the, the acceptable uh, score. Because the acceptable score, if, if Gemini, for example, was not a public uh, thing, maybe it's a fun tool that is just meant for to mod, like how initially Grab started the, the, the X uh, or Twitter uh, tool. Like it, if it's meant to be a joke, then that could be an acceptable, uh, you have high tolerance for this, it's fine. You put the founding fathers with different uh, ethnicity. Uh, so again, the acceptable uh, standards here is the last thing. So once you have the quality, the test coverage, now you will start having conversation inside the organization. And this is where the quality standards should apply. As to, to, to mention that you have to put quality uh, um, test coverage, how are you testing your, 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 your application on your data? Now, the, the, these quality standards or these test case, cases are left for the teams to define them. And... I've heard a lot of talk about model cards. What's your opinion on those? Is it kind of in the same vein as that? Yeah, it is It is an attempt from the industry to cover this gap, to close this gap. Uh, with every model provider, whether they're, we're not even talking about Genii or even you know, networks, all providers, they, they share, whether it's a marketing effort or like a technical effort or academic, they share how my product is performing. It, and that's the, the point of it, like because, and that proves the point. That proves that they need it as providers, and their customers, who is who are the other data scientists building applications, top of it, they need it. So we need to know from the is building a model and building a new company, right? That's going to compete with OpenAI. Then I want to know how do you think it's performing against OpenAI? Now the missing part that we saw from the industry here that it doesn't have the enough trust. Like that, the sufficient trust to start working on them. From the data sets that are being used, it's not clear what they are. From the methodology that's being used, it's not clear what it is. Uh, from the metrics and then what's the acceptable. So all these details, and obviously from the risks, like everybody's thinking about risks from their own angle, and they can put any uh, any results in their model cards versus others. So we want to standardize that too, which is the same pillars that we mentioned before: the the test cases, or the the coverage, the metrics, the methodology, and acceptable guidelines or acceptable thresholds. Now, once we set these as standards, then everybody should come in. I'm a provider, I'm OpenAI, I have GPT-5 coming out. I will benchmark it and I will create a model card that follows these gold standard principles. What I really like here is that once you have the test coverage out there and you understand what how it's performing, you don't need only technical people in the room. You can have other people and that's the beauty of it, right? That's where the subject matter experts can come through or a diverse range of selected people can come through and look at the results and say, okay, uh, have we thought about this as a test coverage, uh, Kate? Yes. 
that's music to my ears. This is, and then this is where you collectively start chasing that long tail of edge cases and in a systematic way. Like you, the long tail of edge cases and known thing is now just exponentially growing in risk with the Gen AI capabilities. Then the, the chasing that long tail is not something that you do in a notebook or something, or usually it's in the data scientist's head. Okay, we've seen these cases before, but now you have a systematic way and we've seen customers start with Okay, 10, 20 test cases. That's our understanding of our domain today. And then a few months into, uh, uh, you know, testing with this approach, they have hundreds of these test cases. And now it becomes, okay, now I have, cover, I'm, I have more understanding of my own domain as a company, I collectively. And I love what you said here about like, okay, everybody, the product manager who is, who is a customer comes in, even the customers collaborate and leadership. Because when we start thinking about testing, that is the name we chose for our company, Colena. It's an Egyptian slang for all of us. And that's the point of it. It's like, okay, all of us are collectively working together, collaborating in, uh, into chasing that long tail. Dude, so you want to know, speaking of Egyptian slang, uh, my favorite thing about the whole conference is that it made... <laughs> people always say that... Mohammed is the most common name on uh, earth. I was like, I don't know that many Mohammeds. At this conference, we've got three different Mo's talking. Uh, and <laughs> it, true to form, we are perfect uh, distribution. Of, <laughs> this, re yeah, this reflects actually the real sample here of the, of, uh, the, the real population sample, in the world. Exactly. <laughs> the population in the world, yeah. It, obviously, it's it, it just a coincidence it happened. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we this is something that we, uh, especially if you look at the uh, uh, the uh, yeah, the name is very common, right? And then we we start seeing here like, oh, okay, we need um, a representative from this organization. We need the the leader in this organization. And it starts happen. Uh, my name is Mohammed too. So it's like, uh, but it's it's fun. It's fun to have everybody there. Yeah, you know, I I know I've been uh, kind of a pain in the ass the last couple months on trying to make sure that we have representation from diverse fields and it Absolutely. is so cool to see this coming together right now we've got so many incredible speakers and i'm so excited because we're i think we're almost hitting the goal that i set out with where i wanted to have 50 percent male 50 percent female i don't know if we fully hit it but we're close man and that's really cool yeah uh, for me to see because I know that's really important. And having two daughters, you also have two daughters too, right? So like- A, da a daughter and a son, but yes, okay. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there we go. You have, yeah, yeah. You have a daughter. <laughs> <laughs> having two daughters, you have a daughter. It makes, we're like trying to create the world so that hopefully- Absolutely. If they ever want to get into this field, they don't feel that uh, stigmatism or they can see others in the field doing Absolutely. What they're doing, so. Yeah, and we talk about representation matters, right? Like representation matters. Obviously, it matters even more when you're trying to standardize the, the know, most important ridiculous. technology. <laughs> the most important technology. You know, in our lifetime. Where you just sit around and it's a bunch of men between 25 and 45 talking about white males talking about how we need ah, more diversity, I more representation. A new gold standard. Yeah, no, we're not going to do that. The diversity here comes not just in the gender, gender, race, uh, uh, location, domain. We focused a lot. You know that's very well. We focus on domain being represented. We focus on everybody coming as a leader and influencer in their or our own organization so that we can take actual actions uh, with this. So everybody's coming, coming representing their own organization into this AI quality movement. It's going to be very exciting. I'm very excited about it. And of course, we're going to throw in a few of these curveballs from my side. We are going to have a little jam room, I think. Joe yeah. Reese is going to be there and he's going to be able to DJ. And we've got my buddy, Mikhail Eric, who did a awesome. stand up set at the last virtual conference. I love that. And he's going to be making fun of me and do a little stand up <laughs> set here, too. So, yeah, I'm super excited, man. It's coming together, it is going to be a blast. Yeah, and excited for this. Yeah, get your tickets early. Then we're we're about to sell out probably by uh, in the next few weeks. Yep, and and of course, like you said, there are tangible outcomes that we're shooting for. We've got working groups coming out of this, which is awesome to see. Like these special interest groups, the working groups that anyone can join. So even if you are not able to make it in person, hit us up about the working groups because 
that's how we're going to move the ball forward in the industry. Yes, sir. Let's do it. All right, man. Well, it was great talking to you and I'll see you soon enough. We, we sync like every other day ah. considering we're, yeah, 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 we're getting speakers. We're doing all kinds of stuff for the conference. So, uh, yeah, but it, it's been good to have you here. Sky is point. Yeah. And let's, uh, let's put this together and want to hear from everybody who's watching this episode as we, as we build for it, we have two months until the conference. Let us know your thoughts. Let us know if you're thinking about uh, how we can collaborate. If you can't make it in person, let us know. Or if you can make it in person, great. Let, let Demetrius and I know we can meet now and we start thinking this This is a, a huge effort that is that requires a lot of people in the industry so that we can add the, to the EU Act and the NIST regulations. We can provide something that is applicable and is actually something that provides safe AI. So let's work together as an industry for this. Love it, man. It's inspirational. Right awesome, on. Do it. Have there we luck. go.